Hi, my name is Enrique Madeira, and I may not be an artist, but I am an actor, which means we both chose this field of work because we desperately seek the validation of others. <clears throat> In this podcast series, I will be interviewing different types of artists who work in different medias, whether that's drawing, clay making, glasswork, etc., and how they support themselves and their artwork, whether it be by commissions or selling their souls to corporate companies. <laughs> I will also be informing you about the oohs and oats about asking artists for commissions and how to be a good patron and overall better person. So please, enjoy yourself. Okay, so let's start off with you. Tell us your name, where you're from, and your occupation. <laughs> uh, Robbie Jones, where I am currently from or where I am originally from? Yeah, where you're originally from. I'm actually originally from Kansas. Garden City, as a matter of fact, which nobody's ever heard of, unless you just watched a recent In Cold Blood thing on whatever, because there's a famous Truman Capote book called In Cold Blood, and it was written about the Clutter family that gets murdered in, anyway. So that's the famous part about Garden City. Also, it's 50 miles from Dodge City, the famous Wyatt Earp Dodge City, so, but no one else has heard of Garden City. There you go. You're, you're, I'm from a small town, basically. You're an enigma, basically. I love that. So yeah, so that's where I'm from, and my job is I am a professor of theater design and technology. Nice. All right, um, so tell our audience what it is you, you commissioned or what you created. What I commissioned? Yeah, you told me in the class you used to like make little figurines or sets of things, tiny sets of things. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I don't commission them. They, they get commissioned. Is that what you're saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. They get commissioned. Um, I, I make props. So I make props full size that we do in theater. I also make really small props for collectors. So they're all based on movie replicas of some kind. Everything I do is pretty much around a film prop. And so uh, that's what I do. I make very small versions of props from films. Nice. And these are for collectors. Yeah. And, and you refer to them as figurines. Figurines are more sculptural. Uh, we're figures. Figure. Or action figures. Or posable movie characters. I don't know. The, the collector community is really touchy. They're not dolls, in quotes, because uh, the hyper-masculine people get really upset when you call them dolls, even though they really are, that's what they are, they are dolls. But I make props for dolls. Beautiful. Um, kind of leading into that, um, how did you get started in it? Um, what drew you to it? Uh, 2007. I, I've been making props my whole life. I did it before I ever got into the visual arts. I did it before I got into theater. Um, so I've, I've been making them since I was a kid because I thought it'd be really cool. In fact, one of the very first props I ever made was the the minigun from Predator. I was like, oh, that is so cool. So I made one out of wood when I think I was like 12 or something, uh, which is funny because I shouldn't have seen the movie. I was 12. Oh. Um, but I loved it. I loved the movie and I, and I, I was a horror movie freak. And so um, I decided because my dad, uh, uh, his, his father was a carpenter and a contractor. So we always had a garage full of tools. And so I'm the curious type, so I just go out and I start making stuff. And so I started that, and then that progressed into getting the visual arts, sculpting and painting and things like that. And then theaters kept giving me money, so I decided to be a theater person. Even though I'm not really a theater person, um, I just get paid to do it. Uh, but then I got to make props for, for theater. And so then that developed from there into the collector community. Um, this is a long conversation, but the point is, is about 2006, I was introduced to the 12-inch action figure collectible community, and um, it was all based on movies, which I thought, because I love movies, um, and so I thought, man, that's really cool, and so I started following uh, different chat boards and, and stuff, and actually bought my very first one, I think it was in like 2008, and um, then because I had props experience and model building experience, uh, there seemed to be a need for some uh, part of the custom custom collector community where people are making them on their own and so uh, To fulfill some of the the things we're missing like satchels and backpacks. I was like hey I could probably make those so I started making those 
and that had developed after that and has continued to snowball more and more and more. Instead of making, you know, one or two, I make, now I'm making as many as a hundred, all handmade, produced by me, um, using all sorts of different technologies and handmade stuff and uh, yeah, so that's what leads to where I'm at now. And I'm still doing it, I just don't have any time right now because the university's going. So. I see. so to polish this technique, it was basically a lot of trial and error, kind of oh, like yeah. putting two things together. Yeah, because there is no how-to. What I, what I discovered, and this kind of riffs from theater, is uh, what I find when making a even, a, a, even a miniature one, it's best to just make it like the real thing. So in theater, especially design, we research and we research and we research. And so what I do is I research the real prop. So not only do I go to the film and really look at the film, but then I try to determine based on what I see in the film, what I think is probably the real thing. And so then that allows me to research that real thing specifically, because most props from film are actually, uh, they're not just completely 100% fabricated. Even things from like science fiction movies and all that stuff, most of that stuff comes from a culmination of multiple things that the props people put together to create this new kind of thing. And so if you can uh, uh, deconstruct or uh, de uh, I don't know what the word I'm looking for, uh, break it down into what its original parts are, it makes it easier to research so you know what the details are. So going backwards before you can go yeah, forward. Yeah, exactly. And so then that allows me to either get my hands on a real piece that I can then scale from or find some really good research about that specific part and then it's e much easier to break it down into actual sizes because no one is telling me how big this is. We just know that in this particular community that it's one sixth. So everything that I do is I divide it by six. So if it's a foot long in real life, then I divide that by six and then it ends up being, you know, however long. And so. Uh, having the real prop or the real thing, having access to it allows it much easier. Then I, I'm not inventing necessarily, I'm actually just doing the math and shrinking it down. Nice. A lot of thinking into it. <laughs> A lot of thinking. I've been working on one particular prop um, for f five years and I haven't gotten it right yet. So I'm still in. That's the thing about this particular, especially when it comes to me, is there's no timetable for this. I get it done when I feel the confident that I have it right. And so it could be a couple of weeks, it could be six years. Um, there's, again, there's projects. I'm, the one, a really big one I'm working on currently is, uh, has been going on for over, over two years. Jeez. And I'm getting, and I got new research and stuff like that, so I make corrections and so I'm making it, and I'm updating it, things like that. So, um, and I'm fortunate enough in the collector community the, the interest is not just fly by night, oh, it'd be great to have this. These collectors are fanatical when it comes to films and accuracy. And most of the stuff that we build is based on older movies. So these are things that collectors have been wanting for a lifetime, not just, oh, it's the new Avengers movie, so I need this fancy little thing. It's, oh, it's from The Shining, which is in, from the 70s. So, you know I mean? So the, the, the commitment to it from the collecting community is, is much stronger than just kind of overnight stuff. Um, was there anyone or anything that inspired you to go into this? I know you said previously it was horror movie and you were a horror movie freak. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I've, been, I've been fortunate enough. I mean, this particular thing that I'm working on is a culmination of a lifetime. And that sounds really lofty, but it's the reality. When I was a kid, uh, my older, my oldest brother uh, played with GI Joes, and these were 12-inch GI Joes from the old school 1960s. And so my middle brother and I were lucky enough to get hand-me-downs. And so that was my first GI Joe. It was actually from the 60s, even though it was way before my time. Um, and so I always, and they were old and broken, so I had to repair things and do all that stuff and try and make different things for them. Um, and so it was things that I always wanted as an action figure when I was a kid. And so now the technology and the community has now grown enough that these things are real. So it's just kind of been a culmination of things I've always liked to do. I like to build models, I like to build props, I love movies. So it just kind of has all gelled in the last 10 years as this collector community has really taken off. It wasn't just one thing, it was like multiple yeah, things multiples, that kind of got you there. Multiples, yeah. So, um, you started as early as you, as 12, right? Is when you kind of really I, started, I started building. I started sculpting when I was probably six. 
because, and I, we're not saying that I was any, and I still am not actually very good at it, but um, to, I was raised by my grandmother because both my parents worked, and so when I was, you know, five and six, I would go stay with her in the afternoons when I, after I got out of kindergarten, and so to help occupy my time, I would watch PBS, watch Sesame Street, things like that, Electric Company, but also, because I like to work with my hands, even as a small child, my grandma got me clay, and so I would just sit and make clay things all day long because I like doing it, and, and it was always people, it was always creatures and things like that, so it was always geared towards that, and um, it just has continued to progress after that. So I've always kind of had that, uh, like to work with my hands, and that um, that idea of like making little people and stuff. So that's that's not anything that was shown to me, it just seems to be an instinct that I've always had. So, but it all started with my grandma and Clay from Alco Discount Store. So, there you go. Um, in terms of pricing, um, and for anything you create, is it more of a negotiation, or do you have a sort of set price? Um, I have to look at things of, because some of these things take me a really long time. And most things don't take me a long time to actually produce one, necess or to produce this very specific thing, but there's days, hours, weeks, months, years of trying to figure out how to make it. And so I have to take into account as a freelance artist or as a commercial artist, whatever you want to call me, that I have to take into account that that's my time, you know. Um, if I were to charge based on an hourly on how much thinking I go into these projects, no one could ever afford anything I do. But I still have to take into account that. And what over the years, um, I've lost tons of money, <laughs> but that's fine. It's not a big deal because it's, it's, a, it's something that I enjoy doing. But at the same time, um, I have to, as an artist, I have to make sure people value my time and my energy and my effort. And so, um, so figure out prices that reflect, it's a tricky balance. Getting people to pay as much as they possibly will for it, but at the same time not overcharging. And you know, because there's, if I were to add up all my hours, no one could afford anything, so I have to figure out that kind of balance. But because of the scale I work on, I'll produce anywhere from 25 to 300 pieces. And so the more pieces I make oftentimes means each one can be cheaper because I'm doing them in a, what we call a run. So, you know, I'll make 25 of one thing. And so instead of making one and then moving to another one, making another one, it's like I do one step and I do it for all 25 or 100. And then I do the next step, all. And so that helps balance it out, and that's mass production. That's what Henry Ford developed and, and all that. So, yeah, assembly line. So that all plays into it. Um, but in the big picture for me, it comes down to oh, there's some really important people walking through the hallway. That's oh, really kind of scary. Oh, uh, that's like chancellors and stuff. Anyway, doesn't matter. Um, anyway, uh, the baseline that I feel that I really need to to work in is a minimum of thousand dollars for the whole thing. Uh -huh. Sometimes that means twenty-five at a thousand dollars. So you do the math, you can figure out how much each one would cost. Um, it also could mean five, you know, or it could be even more than that. Um, but the amount of effort and energy and thought that goes into it, anything less than a thousand dollars is just really kind of. It's just not enough for me to commit that much of my, my life to it. And because we're, we're and this isn't like, oh, I do it on the weekends and I made $1,000. I mean, it takes months and, and stuff to process all this stuff. So that's kind of the, the cutoff point. So if somebody really wants one piece and they're the only one that wants it, no matter what it is, I need to make about $1,000 to put in the energy that it takes to figure out how to make that item. Which is why I encourage people to get a group of people together so they all agree all 50 of them want this particular object then it becomes manageable for those those individuals because then instead of a thousand dollars one person's paying it's a thousand dollars maybe that all of them uh, are breaking down into individuals so communication is key almost well yeah and just trying to figure it out and also it's just instinct as well because some props take a little quicker or some some are quicker to develop than others some are extremely complex um, I made the, the dolly that Hannibal Lecter's carried on. This was, a, I, this was one of the most uh, daunting projects I ever worked on, and that was years ago. I've done bigger things now, but um, 
when I originally priced that out to people, it was much lower because I didn't know what I was doing and so I had to figure it out. And it took me a, a, a number of years to actually figure it out. And so I actually ended up having to raise the price because I was like, it's just, just in materials, the price I quoted people, I wouldn't have, I would have lost money just on material costs, let alone how much my time goes into it. Um, even in mass production, it still wasn't cost effective. Um, so it's, it's just tricky. You just have to figure it out. What's the one thing you enjoy about what you do? What gives you the most joy out of all this? Uh, I like working. I like problem solving. That's, I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of factors to it, but one is problem solving. I love figuring things out. I, I like puzzles. I like figuring out what the process is. That's one of, my, that's one of the most favorite things to do is figure out a process. And so I enjoy that aspect of it. Um, I also get to work on a famous prop. You know, um, the suitcase from, or the briefcase from Pulp Fiction. I did a number of those. And it was like really cool because it was like, I was trying to get, I was trying to make it the most accurate thing humanly possible to the film. It kind of was like my way of being a part of the production team that worked on the film, you know, <laughs> one of my, my favorite films. So, you know, it's that kind of thing, that kinship with the movie and that analyzing and trying to figure out what the props people have done and that connection to the film is really important. And then honestly, one of the biggest things for me is, um, uh, the appreciation from from the collecting community. There's some fanatics out there, some just fanatics about the pieces that are made and um, uh, and their enjoyment because it's magical to them. It's not magical to me anymore because I've spent so many hours trying to figure out how to do this one step to do this next step. But when a collector gets something, um, the question is often asked, "How do you do this?" And it's actually not that hard once you break down into the different components, but the magic of it. It's kind of like a magic trick. When they open up a box or a package and they hold it in their hand, and I've done, I've done a, a good enough job that they can't see how, they don't instantly figure out how it's been made. It's just this kind of magical thing that shows up. And so the, the, the feedback that I get from, from a lot of my, my collectors, and most of my collectors are the same people. They buy the same. And it's very much like an art community, and that's how they view this kind of stuff because it's expensive. I mean, some watches will run a hundred. I've I've sold a watch that you can't even fit on the end of your pinky for a hundred. I think it was one hundred twenty dollars for this watch, but it was extremely complex, and there's all these different layers and stuff. And so, for somebody to spend one hundred twenty dollars on a watch that they can't wear, that's an expensive watch just in general. You know, it's not a, a, you know a, a rich watch or anything, but you know, I mean, you can go to Walmart and get a watch for five dollars, you know. Um, but if somebody's willing to, you know, pony up one hundred twenty dollars for this tiny little thing, um, it's a different kind of person. Um, the collecting community, very fortunate. Now that's not saying that it's perfect. There's a lot of fucking assholes out there, but yeah, but it's, sure. because the collector community has a tendency to draw all sorts of people. So you know, and the fanaticism when it comes to film and things like that can work against you as well. So yeah. Well, that is all the questions I have. Thank you so much, Robbie, for your time. Have a good day. Hi, my name is Enrique Madeira, and I may not be good at making an entrance, but I am good at leaving people high and dry. Please, stay tuned. And remember, enjoy yourself. <laughs>